Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, I, I was about to say I'm reacquainted with an old friend, but it's not. This is a new friend. This is the new Explorer. Uh, I've borrowed it from uh, my fine jewelers. I'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, but basically, as you guys know, it's a watch I've owned for seven years now. I want to see the differences. I want to see, is it worth upgrading to? Uh, what are the advantages, disadvantages compared to the old one? It's a watch I've been obsessed with for so long uh, and I still am to this day. It inspired watches I've co-designed, several watches I've co-designed and will continue to, I, I, I feel. So, a lot to talk about. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take a lovely walk, it's a beautiful day, and get to know the new Explorer. So this is an older version, I'll get into all of that, we'll compare all the rest of it. I was due to borrow a Glashut original, I've probably butchered that, I apologise to my German gentry. But you know what, I'll cover that later on, uh, because of course Moya Fine Jewelers, they're an authorised dealer for them, there's plenty of time. But this was for sale, uh, because they also sell used luxury watches. And you know what? I had to borrow it. Is it worth upgrading all the rest of it? I sent in my Tudor Submariner. It's being serviced by them, by their top uh, watchmaker. Because I noticed a little bit of rust under the dial. I'm uh, a bit concerned because obviously it's a very expensive watch. Thankfully the movement's okay. And they're very attentive, which is important because I don't want any polishing. I don't want any unnecessary work. Oh, and I should do a gear check because that's what we did last time when we went to New York. If you missed that video, have a look back. Uh, so last video, I discussed my new Boeing uh, backpack from Carfrio. I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. It's a bit too big just for, you know, an afternoon walk. I wanted something a little bit smaller, but this I found on Amazon. This is um, a crossbody bag. I've never actually owned a crossbody bag like this. As you can see, it's fairly faithful in style. I think they match pretty nicely. I'm a big fan of Hugo Boss. Uh, a lot of the clothes you see, like the jackets, sports jackets, blazers, that kind of stuff, suits as well, are from Hugo Boss, uh, among my Italian British stuff. Typically, I order straight from Hugo Boss, but this was on Amazon. And I do like, on the back, you can, if you want to wear it on your left side or your right side, or, you know, the strap, you can just switch it over. So really clean, nice design, just tastefully done, exactly like the Carl Frieda. It's perfect because, as you see, it's just easier to get the camera out. I've got enough room for a book, extra lenses. Let me just, there you go, in case I want to do macro. Little pen holder there. Everything I need for a day shooting, and it's got these lovely big looped zips that are just so ergonomic. And the outside pocket, which of course, I'm gonna put batteries, spare batteries for this, and the audio interface, all the rest of it. So I'm, I'm pretty chuffed. And in my pocket, I will swap out from these two watches. And of course, I'm using my Unico that I co-designed with Carl Friedrich. That'll be in my pocket. I don't like to keep expensive watches in the bags. That's another advantage of the, uh, the Unico. I like to keep them on my person at all time. So this is just more convenient. I can slip it out, uh, swap, so you'll see me wearing either. Let's get outside before we lose light. The Explorer was my favorite watch for about five years until it was dethroned of that title by the arrival of a watch in 2019. We are of course talking about the 30 Atmos reissue, a revival of a very early and massively historically important 1950s diver by Squire. Now, I've discussed and shared the history of the Explorer in depth many times over the years, so I will try to be brief here, but there is some important things to note, especially how it embodies the brand's ingenious knack for creating icons and being a marketing genius in general. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the 1953 Mount Everest expedition, which led to the creation of the Explorer when Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay took a Rolex Oyster Perpetual with them. This was no accident. The inclusion was very deliberate branding to show the world just how capable the Oyster case was. During the mid-1950s, there was a slew of variations as the Rolex Explorer design language was formed into what we now instantly recognize as its foundations. 
Most notably was the reference 6350, which technically was not the first explorer, but this 36mm sized watch was the first to feature the word explorer on the black dial. The Dauphine hands were exchanged for Mercedes style, and most importantly of all, those indicative Arabic numerals at 3, 6 and 9. This is unequivocally the quintessential key traits to what is an explorer. This was then solidified for the next 27 years with the longest produced explorer of all time. We are talking about the Capo Lavoro, the 1016. This was introduced in 1969, the watch of choice by many celebrities and style icons. But perhaps most influentially, the writer and creator of James Bond, Ian Fleming. In fact, if you piece all the literary mentions together in several of his 007 novels, one can conclude that the actual real Bond watch was the Explorer, as intended by Fleming. So fast forward to 1989, and that's when my Explorer, the 14270, was introduced. Well, uh, not technically the precise version I have, because there was a whole myriad of different series. Uh, the kind of stuff that collectors go absolutely crazy for. And some of the series were very short-lived. Take, for example, the blacked out dial versions, which had black lacquer on the numerals. And now, uh, in typical Rolex fashion, are highly desired by collectors. Crazy to think that when they were first released, uh, they weren't that uh, warmly received. So typical Rolex. My Explorer is from the more ubiquitous last A and P series from 1998 to the year 2000. It's identifiable by having Swiss made on the dial, which also signifies Rolex adopting Superluminova for their luminous compound. Gone are their lug hole cases, tritium loom, glossy dials that some even became cracked over time and known as frozen dials, and the chunkier white printing on the previous series. With these later series, we also saw the introduction of the flip lock clasp, similar to the one I have on my Tudor Submariner. I actually sold the bracelet that came with my Explorer as I simply never wore it. This is, after all, the king of strap versatility, and a watch that helped me coin the urban gentry phrase, a strap monster, way back in 2017. Inside all series of the 14270, over its 11-year production run, was the Calibre 3000. This highly dependable automatic movement was the last to feature a breguet overcoil for the hairspring. But despite this, it achieved chronometer certification with an accuracy of about plus 4 to minus 6 seconds a day. Then, in 2001, Rolex replaced the 14270 with a new Rolex Explorer, the 114270. So what does the addition of that extra one at the beginning of the reference signify? Well, now it's powered by the vastly upgraded Calibre 3130, and I've expressed my admiration for this particular movement many times over the years. Externally, there were no discernible changes, but inside, it was a very different beast. The newer, highly anti-magnetic parachrome hairspring and the microstellar balance wheel was now mounted on a full balance bridge and offered a greater resistance to shocks, among many other architectural refinements to the movement. So in 2010, we saw the biggest change, quite literally with the Explorer, with the introduction of the first 39 millimeter diameter, uh, and that was the reference 214270. But they did a bizarre thing here. They released it with the Mercedes hands in the same scale as the 36 millimeter, making them undersized. They fixed that a year later with the Mark II. Uh, for whatever reason, God knows. But some people actually kind of like it and makes the Mark I more unique. Should we grab a seat? You can nod with the camera. Vuoi giocare? Facciamo un partita, dai. Now this is incredible, as you can see. Based on uh, Dante Alighieri's uh, Divine Comedy, of course. I've seen the original in Paris, but this is a beautiful reproduction. 
quite haunting and you can see the thing uh, at the top. Carino qui, eh? Tranquil. Andiamo a sedere? Naturally, I had to bring this along. Of course. <laughs> And I flip it open and it's talking about vodka, so uh, good thing I also brought that along. <laughs> These larger explorers were discontinued in 2020. A year later saw the most controversial version yet, with the first two-tone explorer in 2021. As you might imagine, I had a healthy amount of skepticism towards it. For a Datejust or a Subby or Yachties and Daytonas, etc. Sure, why not? But for Rolex's last, most honest tool watch, maybe it was a step too far, perhaps. Or are we simply trying to cling on to the past and completely deluded and should accept that the tool watch days are long gone and call it for what it really is, preposterously expensive luxury fashion accessories. But in all fairness, I have yet to experience this in the metal. And as you know, in life, experience is the ultimate teacher. Let's not forget, for donkey's years, I dismissed the Explorer for being rather boring. In fact, overly simple. I just didn't really get what the fuss was about. Fast forward to now, it's one of my top favorites. So I keep an open mind. Also in 2021, we saw a return to form with this, the 124270, which was very welcomed by purists who believe it should only uh, the, the Explorer should only be in uh, stainless steel and 36 millimeters, just in case the, uh, the two-tone alienated and ruffled too many feathers. A wise move by Rolex, a clever one-two punch strategy. But the big question is, is it worth the upgrade, especially for me and owners of previous versions? What are the differences? What are the disadvantages? Well, let's take a closer look. The 124240 has all the upgrades you'd come to expect, naturally compared to my late 90s Explorer of mine. Inside is the pinnacle of Rolex's in-house watchmaking mastery, the automatic caliber 3230. It was introduced in 2015, the same year they effectively redefined the term superlative chronometer to an even higher accuracy of plus or minus two seconds a day. It also has a boosted power reserve of up to 70 hours, further making it a great Monday to Friday watch. And then you, of course, you take it off for the weekend for something perhaps a little bit more lively. And this was all thanks to a whole host of patented developments that I won't bore you with, but perhaps the best example is the Chronogy Escapement. So as you can imagine, this caliber is superior in precision, resistance to shock and magnetic fields. Certainly an impressive bit of kit. The only drawback was, of course, a slight increase in overall thickness in order to house it. So it went from my lovable 11 millimeters to a smidgen under 12 millimeters. The manual wind is also noticeably smoother and easier to wind. That is once you unthread the virtually identical twin lock crown. The flat sapphire is the same as far as I can tell. And in terms of finishing of the watch, you see the typical mix of brushed and high polishes. No major changes there. The dial has some alterations too, and for most watch designs, it might not seem like much, but in the world of the relatively minimal Explorer, it's kind of a big deal. Most obviously, as with any contemporary Rolex, we have the added rehort engraving on the inner ring framing the dial itself. Personally, I like them, but what do you guys think? Then we have the return to a slightly overall chunkier typeface printing. Die-hard Explorer experts will welcome this subtle and more legible nod to a style before the introduction of the highly desired Swiss-only dials of the transitional 14270 that ran from 1998 to 1999. But the biggest development has to be the addition of the proprietary chromolite luminescence on all the white gold applied markers, which are also ever so slightly larger and sharper edged than before. The loomed 369 gives a dramatic boost in low light orientation and readability. This was very much the Achilles heel of the 14270 dial design. This is a logical and pleasingly harmonious return 
to a perfectly balanced dial. This, quite frankly, is so compelling, in fact, it's got me considering the upgrade. Crazy what we do for something relatively innocuous in the whole scheme of things, especially in a watch that still is excellent in low light without this improvement. I guess this is the insanity of watch obsession. This is, after all, in my opinion, the most influential dial layout of all time, for me at least. Most surprisingly, and I've got to say the biggest advantage if you have a six and a half inch wrist like mine on this particular version is that size adjustment. It's amazing what taking a millimeter off here, a millimeter from there without compromising the diameter, how differently it wears um, because it has repercussions on just about every part of the watch from the bracelet, the case, the clasp, everything. I was not expecting this. Now this is the most fascinating aspect of this new model. The size decrease not only shaves off a little bit of 904L oyster steel from the lugs, but the overall length of the 42 millimeter tip to tip, which makes it a millimeter less than mine. As a result, the tapering of the bracelet starts sooner, which then in turn makes the solid end length smaller too. This therefore extends all the way to the modern and super handy easy link extendable clasp, which gives you a very nifty five millimeters, which is great in hotter weather when your wrist expands. With everything being just a little bit smaller on most of the case and bracelet, but while still keeping the 36 millimeter diameter, the total weight is therefore decreased. So you get the same quintessential Explorer look, but even more comfortable for everyday wear. It's very simple if you think about it, but very clever. The trade-in, however, is a less strap-friendly 19mm lug width. So let's address the annoyingly gargantuan elephant in the room, money and value. Yeah, um, unfortunately it's kind of inescapable when talking about Rolex, but I have written here the um, retail price, according to the Rolex website at the time of making this video, is $7,200. That's if you can find one. On the used market, uh, like this particular one, they're going for around about 10, around 10 grand. Yes, I know, crazy. One thing is for sure, it's no longer the sweet spot, especially when you consider how much I paid for my version back in 2016, which was around 70% less on the used market than what the price of this is commanding right now. Is it worth it? Well, that's for you guys to decide. Please, you know, let me know your thoughts in the comments. For me, it's not. I, I just don't see spending, you know, I'm gonna have to put a lot of money to upgrade for essentially the same watch, just for changes I'm never really gonna notice. If I had DuckTales money, sure, why not? But then again, if I did have DuckTales money, I would be recording this in a villa in, Tusc <laughs> in Tuscany. So yeah, it's up to you, I guess. The Explorer still is a watch that benefits from the value retention, superb build quality and heritage of the brand without the vulgar flashiness or the baggage that comes with most of their heavy hitters. If you forget about the money and the brand logo on the dial and put that aside for a moment, the 124270 is the most realized version of the Explorer yet. It feels like an Explorer. Unlike my former ceramic sub, which I used to own, it feels nothing like the vintage sub that I currently own and traded it in for. I struggled to think of any improvements that I would actually like to see. Maybe a glide lock uh, style system on the clasp, perhaps. But really, it still retains everything that makes the Explorer just so utterly compelling. It's the greatest distillation of a Rolex field turned sports watch for any situation, any attire and any environment. Unpretentious, low key, it's still got a 007 classiness and deeply rooted British puritanical discreetness that I really can't help but admire. It's there to do a job, nothing more, nothing less. It's still the ultimate do-it-all watch, and for me, always will be. So ultimately, it might not be my favorite watch any longer, but it still is my favorite dial of all time, and I think it will continue to inspire many more watches I design in the future, so stay tuned. Typical, really, because um, Rolex finally make the perfect Submariner 
probably didn't slip there, so <laughs> I'll do that again. They finally make the perfect Explorer, and of course, it's too much uh, money for me, or not really, it's, I mean, I can afford it, it's just, it's more than I'm willing to pay for it. That's the key distinction there. There comes a moment, which I think happens to most watch enthusiasts, that you realize you have a truly great watch on when you get a sudden desire just to sell everything else and call it quits in terms of collecting. Naturally, that only lasts a split second, but the Explorer does that, and only a few watches do. To me, the best way to understand what the Explorer is compared to most of what now Rolex offers is the parallel to another favorite brand of mine, Carl Friedrich, versus the go-to designer brands that they rival. You see, my leather bag, let's take my Bowen for example, they have the same understated timeless classicism aesthetically. The same priority in functionality and extreme high quality. Compared to the overly superfluous name branding or status symbol signaling that most of the other designer brands offer. There's no tacky monogram to prove a point. My Bowen backpack will last me a lifetime, just like an explorer will. You see, I know these items are top quality and that's all that matters and anyone with a good eye would also recognize it, but that's not important to me. Take for example how Rolex use the white gold on the applied markers. It's not there for bling as it's almost indistinguishable from steel, but simply because it prevents tarnishing for far longer than regular steel. You see the same thinking here goes into the Bowen's choice of premium materials like the Italian Vacchetta leather, heavy duty zips or mesh padding for example. What it all has in common is true functional stealth luxury and nobody can deny that the bags or the watch is always going to be good taste. And I'm going to stick with mine for the moment. You know sometimes, and I've said this before, it's the imperfections that give something character. And also now it's gained a whole sentimental um, value that you can't really replace. So yeah, I'm sticking with mine. Anyway guys, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Um, opinions, all the rest of it. Don't forget to like this video, especially if you want to support independent channels like this and want to see more free content. I will catch you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Ciao. So close. So close.